everyone. This is another episode of Buried Under the Bar. I have a very special guest with me, with us today, the big man himself, Ian Valer. Valeri or Valer? Valier. Valier. Okay. I think a lot of people pronounce your name wrong. Am I right? Pronounces it wrong. Unless you're yeah. Frank, you'll get it yeah. Right. Everyone else gets it wrong. Yeah. Okay. So, well, good. That's um. That's actually that will be my first question. We got Rob Strand here. Um. Both of you guys, IFBB pros, preparing for shows now and, and whatnot. So I know Robin, you guys are kind of working with the same coach. Robin's kind of just kind of getting himself within striking distance for a show, but doesn't have anything picked out yet. What about yourself? I'm doing Tampa in what, 10 days, 11 days. Yeah, they're pretty close. 11 days, 12 days. Yeah. How are you feeling about that? I mean, from a physique standpoint, I feel excellent. Uh, I mean, energy level wise, I feel pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm eating a lot of food, but you know, once you get to a certain level of body fat, no matter how much food you're eating, you start to feel kind of shitty, but yeah, you know, 12 days out, I, I feel excellent for sure. I mean. Okay. So Ian, we know there's a lot of things I think you've done like a bunch of podcasts. You're, you're pretty out there right now. Um, so I'm going to try and ask the questions that nobody's asking you. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with a question that is pretty common. I just want to know, um, cause I, from watching videos, I don't really know like how you got into bodybuilding. I know you didn't really do a lot of sports or you, you did like more individualized sports, but what, what's the story? Like what, what happened? Yeah. So I, I kind of like what you're saying there. I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, into the individual sports. I ran track and field one year, uh, in high school. Um, you know, so I always like was, you know, into athletics and lifting weights and stuff like that, even when it was just for track specific training, not so much for obviously bodybuilding training. At this mm. point, I really didn't know anything about bodybuilding. So you're talking like grade 10, 11, 12. I mean, you know, I knew who Ronnie Coleman, those kind of guys were, you know, that they were you know, big guys on the internet even then. So, um, but then getting out of high school, you know, when track wasn't, you know, really a predominant thing, like it wasn't going to be a career for me. Uh, I started working at Popeye's supplements, you know, it's a big supplement chain here in Canada for anyone that's not Canadian. Um, so I started working there and this was like starting to the time where I was like getting into, you know, lifting. I was, you know, but I still really didn't know anything about bodybuilding. Like I didn't have any aspirations to be a bodybuilder, to compete or anything like that. Uh, I really didn't know the first thing about it. But, uh, when I started working there, a couple of the guys there, none of them really competed, but the Popeyes was a sponsor for the local, like the Ottawa November show. That's like a, still a show to this day. Uh, so Popeyes was a sponsor for it at the time. And I was starting to get a pretty decent physique. I mean, the guys were like, yo, why don't you hop in and do the Ottawa show? And I was like, man, I don't know the fucking first thing about bodybuilding. So, you know, but I, uh, I got a coach and, you know, kind of winged it for the first show. And I mean, I looked pretty good. I won the junior class. Um, and, you know, that would have been 2010. I guess the, the rest is history. I mean, you know how it is. Once you do one show, it's like, okay, next time I'm going to do this. I'll be a little better. Okay, next time I'll, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, here, we are, here we are exactly a decade later on this podcast talking about it, right? So. Yeah. So what, what age were you when you did your first show? Uh, I would have been 19. So two, 2010. Uh, but my birthday is later in the year, just after end of November. This was beginning of November. So I would have been 19, just about to turn 20. Cool. I, I met you in 2011. Where yeah. We competed so, so I would have been state. 21. Uh, no, 20 turning 21 that year. Yeah. When That's we did right, junior yeah. nationals. And, and yeah. you won the junior nationals that year. Yeah. 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 Wait, wait, wait. Were you going to ask? Go ahead, Ron. Sorry. So what did you do after you, you did that national? So you were 21, did yeah. that national. What was your next step and how did you go from there to going pro? Yeah, so I actually kind of had a few speed bumps after that. So I did the junior nationals 2011. So that was like what, October, September, October I think it was. Yeah. It was like later in the year that year, I think. It was still hot out, but it wasn't like, it wasn't summer, summer. Um, and then after I did that, I actually got really sick. I got it's a weird series of events. So I don't know if you remember that. Well, obviously you, I'm sure you remember that just as well as I do. Um, that nationals in Montreal, it was like insanely hot there. Uh, and they, that theater, the AC wasn't great and everyone was sweating on stage. I remember, remember we had guys like passing out and throwing up on stage and stuff that I show. remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So with all the guys, then this was back in the day when they used to use, now they use paper towel, but that back then they would just use like cloths, like towels and guys would be sweating. They'd go around white eight, 10, 12 minutes <laughs> down the same towel, you know? So yeah. you got one guy sweat onto the next guy's sweat. Um, and I guess from that, I ended up getting a staph infection, like a really bad staph infection in my chest, like just from the towels being wiped on, open pores being shaved, stuff like that. So I got a really bad infection. Uh, and at first, I, I kind of just didn't really know what it was. I mean, I didn't feel sick. 
Um, you know, there wasn't any like localized sight to it. Like, I mean, a million people will watch this and be like, oh, I did a shot in his chest or something. I'd never done a shot in my chest at this point. I mean, it was, it was nothing like that. Um, there was no localized injection site kind of thing to it. It was just like my, my left pec just started like getting bigger. Like it, it almost looked like I had got like a small breast implant under my pec. It was, it looked really strange. <laughs> so this would have been like, the show was on a Saturday. Say I came home on Sunday. We're talking like by the Wednesday it was starting to get kind of big. Uh, and then I was just like, oh, maybe I just like tweet some training. It's maybe it's just a little inflammation. You know, I don't know. I just kind of trained through it. By the Saturday, it was fucking humongous. <laughs> like, <laughs> like here, it was like this, like legit, like double the size of my other pack. And it was getting to the point where it was, it was so heavy and uncomfortable. Like I couldn't sleep. Like if I laid down, there was so much pressure on it on my chest. It was like, I, I literally couldn't sleep. So I slept sitting up on the Saturday night. And then by Sunday morning, I was like, okay, I should probably go see the doctor. So me being silly and naive, I just went to the walk-in. Like I didn't even take it seriously. I didn't go to the hospital right away. Uh, so I go to the walk-in. The lady looks at right away. She's like, leave here, go straight to the hospital. Don't go home. Don't, you know, don't do anything. Yeah. Like, okay. So like I go to the hospital. Um, and yeah, well, you know, long story short, they you know, did an ultrasound, drew some stuff out. It was just you know, infected staff, like staff infection that had just accumulated and I'd left it in there. So it just like accumulated, accumulated. And it was more infection than my body could fight. And obviously staff can get pretty bad if you leave it. So, um, so then I had to have it surgically drained. And then because I'd left it so long at that point, it had gotten to my bloodstream. So I had like almost, I was septic, right? Like I had a, a you know, a septic infection. So I, I had infections in like all my organs and I was in rough shape, but it's weird because through this whole thing, I almost felt a hundred percent fine. Like it was points where I felt like maybe my heart was like a little racy, you know, like my body was fighting infection, but like, I never felt ill. Like I didn't feel fluey. I didn't feel anything. And if there hadn't have been like a big visible sign, I probably would have left it and just killed myself from a friggin', you know, from sepsis. But so good thing there was a very visible, you know, sign like that. But, uh, so then I, yeah, I had to get a pick line, which is like an IV that goes right into your heart. And I had to wear a fanny pack with an IV pump for like 12 weeks. So like I couldn't work out, I couldn't do anything. I had to sleep with this pump on. So like I'd sleep, I had to unwire all the stuff and sleep with it. It was a fucking pain in the ass. So that basically took me into like January, December, January. And then by the time I got healthy of that, that's when I did for anyone who follows me. And that's when I did the, the big, the big break on my arm. So right when I get healed from the staph infection, then I stupid, I go arm wrestling and I break my arm arm wrestling. So then that puts me out like basically all of 2012, like end of 2011, all of 2012, there was like no bodybuilding going on there. I mean, you know, I had a few months where I'd get back in it and then the other thing happened. It was like kind of back and forth. Um, so, you know, I, I was planning to compete in 2012 that year. I was going to do the Ottawa's again, the men's open, uh, but that year kind of just completely fell apart. Um, so then I took all of 2013 at this point, after all this stuff had happened, I was kind of like, uh, maybe fuck bodybuilding, you know, I'm mean, like, there's so many things that are happening, you know, my physique just isn't where it needs to be. So it was just kind of on the back burner. And that's where I met my wife, Melissa it was in 2012. Um, you know, so like, you know, I was doing the, the dating game, you know, I was like, I would, you know, hang out with her and not really worrying about bodybuilding as much. And, um, you know, I think that by the time 2013 came around, I think she could tell really more that I was missing it, you know, missing the training and the bodybuilding and the competing and stuff like that. So she's like, what are you doing? Like, if you want to compete, like do this shit again, like, don't not do it because you think I'm not going to like it or some shit. So, so then I planned and I did the Ottawa's 2013. That was my first like open show. Uh, and I won the overall there. And then I went and did provincials 2014 spring. I won the overall there and I went to the amateur Olympia two weeks after that. And I won the overall there and turned pro. So crazy. That's a crazy turnaround right there. Yeah. yeah. Was, was Melissa also competing when you first met her there? No, when I met her, she like, she really didn't even work out. I mean, she was like, you know, like the average girl that would go to the gym and she'd maybe do like, you know, 50 minutes on the elliptical and then she'd go into the group X room and do like, you know, five pound lateral raises and, stuff. <laughs> and like exercise ball crunches and planks and stuff. But like she wasn't weightlifting or anything like that. I mean, it's, I, at this point, I think she really thought like the bodybuilding thing was more like repulsive than anything, you know, like, like most women that don't really understand it and, you know, see it and look at it like that. Right. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I definitely didn't win her over with my physique I was <laughs> by any means, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, that was, uh, so no, she didn't really even get into competing. I did the Ottawa show in 2013 and then she watched that and I, she saw the figure and she liked it and she started to, you know, follow like the girls back then was like Nicole Wilkins and Aaron Stern, those kind of girls that were like, you know, doing the Olympian stuff at that time. And she really, really liked their physiques. 
Um, and then, you know, also just like a, an aspect of kind of understanding what I do and what I go through a bit better, you know? So there was kind of a, a culmination of, you know, her wanting to see if she could have her physique kind of like these girls whose physique she really liked and also as well as, you know, kind of understanding better what her, her boyfriend at the time was doing. So, so her and her brother, Chris, and they both did the Sudbury in 2014. So they did, they competed there. And then Chris did the provincials uh, at the same time with me in 2014. So he did, he won the juniors. no. It was a weird thing with this. He like lost to Regan in the juniors, but then beat him 10 minutes later in the men's open. It was like a weird. Remember, I remember that. that. Yeah. <laughs> so there was some like weird shit going on there, but um, so yeah, so we both did that. And then I turned pro right after that one. Yeah. That's cool. So, so Chris and Melissa actually started competing at the same time at the same show. Yeah. Their, both their first show was the Sudbury 2014. Yeah. And they both won the overall. Nice. That's pretty cool. So during that time when you were like, your, during your first show um, to your, you know, that one year where you kind of took off and then going to provincials, winning pro card, you were training with Greg Doucette, right? Yeah, so I, I, I worked with Greg. Um, I started working him with him for the prep that I did for that, that 2013 show. So I didn't work with him in 2010 or 11 when I won juniors, anything like that. I hadn't met him yet. Um, but then when I decided to do Ottawa's 2013, like when I came back and wanted to do like in men's open, I was no longer junior at this point. Uh, that's when I hired Greg. I worked with Greg for that show, uh, the Ottawa's 2013 up to the, the, the two next shows after that until I turned pro. Cause, okay. So there's funny enough. I was just on YouTube today. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't, you probably saw the video that you released. I haven't, I haven't watched the video, but. I've been tagged in enough little clips of it. People, like, yeah. Hey, video. Yeah. I mean, so what? So what? Yeah. What do you have to say? What do you have to say about that? I mean, there's. Okay, look. And the, the one part I did see that Greg said was, at the time when this happened, what Greg and I had discussed of why I decided to leave him is completely true. But that's not the entire story. I had decided to leave Greg because at the time I was I just signed with Gat. Dennis James was, was was with Gat at the time. He was coaching Rami and these guys. Um, you know, and I had an in to get coaching through, uh, with Dennis James, mm -hmm. when you're just turning pro, like someone like Dennis James, that's like, of course, you know, like that's crazy. what that obviously it's obvious. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. You know, to like have interaction with someone that you'd watch the, you know, the videos and been on the Olympia stage, you know, the top five Olympia guys. So to me, that was like a crazy opportunity, but that is a hundred percent true what Greg says, but there's also the aspect of that, that I had debated and from, you know, maybe it's too many cooks in the kitchen, too many people in my ear, you know, but I also knew with Greg's methodology with the not bulking thing, whether there's, you know, truth to that or not, that's a completely different conversation I guess we could have. But, um, but I just thought at the time that that was, I needed to grow a substantial amount to be competitive as a pro. I needed to pack the food in. I needed to do more than I thought Greg was willing to do for me to move to the next level in size. Um, you know, whether that's, right or wrong thing that's up for debate but that's where my mindset was at the time you know i had an opportunity to work with dennis i thought i need to grow more i thought dennis could be a better fit for that position at the time than greg and that kind of was what led to the decision okay so in that video just uh, just let's just stay on that topic for a minute because in the video his main thing was as you just mentioned like not bulking um and the main thing was like you, you know you don't really want me to bulk in an excess of more than 500 calories um, and he was saying kind of, you do agree with him and you don't agree with him. And I have to agree with him in the sense that you do stay pretty damn lean when you're off season, he's season right? 100 calories over, over maintenance. Yeah. yeah lean, so. But like the thing is, so what my question, I guess, or what I wonder is like, is that something that you would give to any athlete? Do, do you think that most people, because we know that you're genetically gifted in terms of staying lean. Do most, do you think that most people are, would you like for, for example, well, Chris maybe it might be a bad example because he looks like he stays pretty lean too. But is that, is that kind of like your general census? Like most of the time you're going to need to push five, more than 500 calories? Yeah, I mean, whether it's 500, 800, 1,000, whatever, that's, that's a, a kind of a relevant thing here. But the point is, yeah, obviously you want to maintain a good body composition. Getting it too far gone is, is going to be a detriment but a lot of processes going on in your body, you know, from your insulin sensitivity to a bunch of things, you know, hormonal function, stuff, regulation, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That I, I agree with. I, I also, though, think main, trying to eat that little above maintenance from a performance standpoint, and when you're trying to grow, 
getting the food in and optimizing performance, getting as much food as possible while maintaining that lean composition is very important. You know, to get the heavy lifts, to be slugging the way you need, you need those, that food to increase, get that performance up. And also okay. the back end of it, I mean, and I can speak 100% from, you know, from my own expertise on this, from doing it myself. I mean, this past off season, for example, I was eating 2000 calories over maintenance. My body composition was good, but what more importantly, what that led to was what I was able to achieve during prep. You know, I'm two weeks out now. I'm eating my lowest day I've gone is 300 grams of carbs and then 30 minutes of cardio. And I'm like skinless right now. If, yeah, I, was eating, if I was eating 500 calories over maintenance to get the same response, I would have need to push a lot lower. I would have need to do a lot more cardio. And I mean, and the proof in the, is in the pudding because I worked with Greg and I starved to work with Greg. I mean, I did very minimal cardio. I'll give him that. And I ate some tasty shit. There's no debate about that. I mean, I was eating PB2 <laughs> sandwiches and popcorn. <laughs> I ate some stuff. I'm not debating that his diet for the average person is way fucking tastier than eating chicken and rice and probably a lot more sustainable. But when you're coming to the big physiques that need nutrient dense foods and they need lots of it, eating that kind of stuff, I didn't think was going to bring me to that next level. And I also thought, and looking back at it now, I mean, you know, you need to push the calories up so that you can push the calories as little as possible down to maintain that performance and keep the calories as high as you can during prep. You know, it's metabolic adaptation like that, right? I mean, if you can keep the food as high as possible and get your body acclimated to utilizing those nutrients efficiently through training, when the time comes for prep, you don't have to push down to 1,800, 2,000 calories. I mean, I can die on 4,000 calories, which technically is basically maintenance for me, but I continually lose weight on that, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's where I come from on that standpoint. I mean, I think, yes, you should always maintain the best body composition. I don't dispute Greg on that whatsoever. Where I dispute him is that, you need to have the food pushed higher to one optimized performance. And he can argue this left, right, and center. Greg has been strong as hell and he's stayed lean doing it. But I mean, from a pro bodybuilder standpoint, I would put myself up in the upper of 1.100% of strongest pro bodybuilders out there. Um, and I didn't get there when I'm super lean. I got that by eating lots of food, by, op, you know, getting as much food as I can and, and just slugging the weights around. I mean, you know, I did that by getting the body mass on me and, and by lifting as heavy and eating as much as I could. Right. So that's, that's I where I'm at. I from. definitely understand where you're coming from. Cause you're also coming from a point where you, you work with the coach that got you as far as he did. And you're always going to be, you know, appreciative of that because you learned Absolutely. a lot and all that. And it was great, but you still want to get to that next level. So you have to definitely work with someone who's going to get you that to that next level. And that's also probably why, you aren't with Dennis James now, and now you're with Patrick. So yeah, I mean, as you evolve as a bodybuilder, also your relationships evolve too. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and th that's how it goes, right? I mean, and then from Dennis, you know, I saw something in Matt, which was a, a hole that I didn't think Dennis could fill. And then, then from Matt to Patrick, I mean, as my physique has in pro progressed, you know, what I think I need from a coach, um, you know, and also for my own learning. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly wanting to learn myself and I, you know, want to try different things and I want to learn from new people. And, you know, when I don't think that I'm still making the progress that I once was with someone, I think that there's maybe a time to move on. I, you know, I don't want to be a coach jumper. I mean, I worked with Matt for four or five years. So it's not like I'm like hopping left, right and center here. You know, I worked with Greg for that, you know, until I turned pro, I worked with Dennis for two, three years. So, you know, but it's, there becomes a time when I think that I can be doing more and that maybe who I'm with is not the person for that job. And it's, it's no, nothing against them. Like you said, I mean, I'm, I'm forever grateful for Greg, Greg. I mean, I looked excellent in all the shows I did with Greg. I turned pro with Greg. I won overalls in every single show I did with Greg being the leanest guy in the show every single time. There's no debate there. And maybe I could have done my rookie season working with Greg and I could have done just as well or maybe better in my, in my pro uh, se uh, rookie season. I, I have no idea. I mean, it's impossible to tell at this point. But where my career has trajectory has ended up, I'm not upset with whatsoever. And I think that the eating and pushing the calories like I have has ended up where I am today. I've always maintained a lean composition. I've become extremely strong. I'm in the top percentile of strong bodybuilders and I can diet eating ridiculous amounts of food. And I think that was because of the last seven years of progressively increasing food way above 500 over maintenance, right? I would agree with that. Now, what's the biggest difference that you've seen now working with Patrick? Like, is there anything that you've learned so far that you really like that you've applied to, like, say, your, your clients, for example? That's a tough question. I think the biggest thing with Patrick is attention to detail is, is just a very, very different level. He's got a very good eye 
um, you know, for picking things that maybe with, you know, other coaches took years to figure out that without me saying a word, he could figure out in a month, you know, you know, by looking at my progress pictures and by, you know, just asking how training, just getting feedback from me and just really keeping an eye on things. I think we learned things at a lot quicker rate. So we were able to move through those initial stages that I might've had to with other people at a, at a vastly different rate. Um, you know, when you get into the dieting, I mean, let's be serious. Once you get to that point, like most of the guys are using pretty similar drug protocols, you know, the food we're all eating chicken and rice and, you know, beef and eggs. And it's all very, very similar in a lot of aspects. I mean, Patrick is definitely a lower protein guy, higher carb guy, whether that's better or worse. I mean, that's neither here nor there. I, I can't really attribute that, you know, that to anything. I mean, you know, I, I definitely am in the best shape I've been and I had one of the most productive off seasons I've been, you know, so there's obviously something to be said for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing with Patrick is, I mean, any question you have, he always gives you a very sound answer with very good detail of why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, and it gives you a sense of security, which for me is, is huge. I mean, just being on the same page with someone uh, and just his, his eye and his, you know, his attention to detail is just kind of second to none in my opinion. Yeah. I find that it's very easy to communicate with Patrick. Yeah. If I have something that I think is right and I explain it to him and he explains his point of view, 99.9% .9 of the time, probably hundred percent of the time, I'm going to agree with him. So yeah. and I and really it, like it, the fact that he's very easy to communicate with. And on, and on the flip side of that, he's also not a know-it-all. You know, if, if he asks for feedback and I say something, he's like, what do you think? You know, what do you think? Like, what are you feeling? Like, do you think you could handle this? You think you could do this? And he takes my knowledge and my, you know, my, yeah, I guess my knowledge of my own body and how things work myself that I've accumulated being in my own body for 30 years uh, and takes that into consideration. It's not just like, I know the best, this is how it is. It's like, what do you think? You know, like maybe you should, you could know too. Let's kind of bang some ideas off each other. Um, you know, obviously he's the one steering the ship, but he definitely takes, you know, my feedback into consideration. He's not just like, this is the way it is, you know? So I, I really like that as well, for sure. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's good. Like, I think that helps build trust too, because you can't, it's hard to trust a, a know-it-all because there's no way that you know it all, right? Does he do your training too, or he just kind of does your he does your diet and protocols and uh, stuff? Yeah, as we've got closer to the show, he's definitely taken more of the reins on my training. Um, you know, in the off season, he would give suggestions, um, but it wasn't like full detailed programming. You know, like sometimes you know he was especially for like weaker points in, in the off season. He you know he was giving me some like backs, you know, workouts and leg stuff like that, um, and more specific stuff to like help lagging parts. Um, but I mean, like, he's not going to write me arm and shoulder training stuff, but like, yeah. I know what I'm doing for those. I've, I've been more than successful from that standpoint. Um, but the points, you know, where I'm, we're feeling I'm falling short, it's like, Hey, maybe this is somewhere that I can contribute into this and give my two cents. And, you know, he would give some stuff for me to do there. And as we've got closer into prep and things are very day to day, like, you know, we're obviously doing pictures every day, twice a day, that kind of stuff. You know, the, the training is very based all around what we're eating that day, how I'm looking that day, what my energy is like that day. So he's kind of steering the ship from that aspect. So it's like, you know, if we eat more food, he'll conduct the training accordingly. If, you know, I'm feeling like this or feeling like this. So it's all kind of just based off the feedback uh, and, he, and he's doing the training accordingly now. So yeah, he's, he's been steering the ship definitely the last like two, three weeks in, in terms of training. Yeah. Okay. So like, we know that you're, again, we know you're a super strong bodybuilder. We know that you're in the top percentile. So with your training in your off season, then when you're kind of handling that on your own, is that something that you periodize or do you, are you kind of just always trying to bill or do you actually schedule in or try to periodize? Like I'm going to take this month. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to crank up the intensity. I'm not going to grow, but I'm trying to gonna get, I'm just going to get fucking retarded stronger yeah. for whatever this month or whatever. Yeah, from, from a loose perspective, definitely. I mean, and, that, and that's also from Patrick's end as well. You know, when we started the off season, that's really how we initiated it was, okay, let's take this initial phase. You know, let's focus our lifts. Let's focus, I mean, everything from the compounds I was using to the lifts we were doing to everything was very focused around getting as strong as humanly possible. And that's really what the goal was. You know, it's, the growth was secondary at this point. We would move into that as more of a second phase. Uh, but it was just get, get as strong as we possibly can and then use that strength to transition into the growth phase and use those strength as over a bigger series of volume. Right. And then that's going to, you know, in, you know, yield more growth, hopefully. Right. Okay. And go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to ask you because you are also a coach. 
Mm -hmm. How, why do you think that a coach needs to have a coach? I think for me, I, I, can, I can only speak for myself. I think for me, it's, it's a hundred percent a mental aspect. I mean, you know, I'm by no means sturdy mentally when it comes to looking at my, I mean, half the days I look at my progress pictures, I want to fucking blow my brains out. Like I, you know, I look at them and I'm like, Oh my God, I can't like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> that's I, everyone. I can send them to like 10 of my buddies. And they're like, you look fucked. This is ridiculous. What are you looking at? And I'm like, Oh, but you know how it is with pictures. You, you think of one thing and you, you need to like, especially with videos, like a progress of yourself. I it's, I have a very hard time looking at it as like an abstract. I'll focus on like one thing. Yeah. It's like, if I'm feeling that day, like my chest is a little flat. I'll take videos and all I'll look at is my chest. And that's all I see. And no matter how good the 99% of my physique looks, it looks like shit because my chest is flat. So it's like, that's the reality though, right? So for me, I need someone to be like, Hey, yo, it's just your chest is a little flat. That's all good. Blah, blah, blah. Let's do this, you know? Or, or, you know, adjust things accordingly. If it was me, I'd probably go way too hard down. I'd be pushing myself till I'm 230 pounds at 0% body fat and look like a stringy piece of shit, but I'd be skinless. I mean, you know, and I, and I know better than to do that with a client, but when it comes to yourself, there's a mental aspect that comes into play there. And I find it very, very hard to be a hundred percent objective looking at my own pictures. You know, I'm always going to pick out some flaw or something. It's like, oh, I can, I take a little more off these glutes. I could do a little more here. I could, you know, Oh, they blah, blah, blah. It's like, I could always do something and it could go the other way. It's like, Hey, maybe my, I feel a little flat this day. Well, let's throw in 10 units of insulin. It's like, that's fucking stupid. You don't need that. You need that. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, it goes from both ways. I mean, you know, I think it's the biggest thing for me is just keeping me mentally steered straight. You know, like, obviously I think there's absolutely no debate that Patrick is far smarter and knows a lot more about coaching has a lot more experience than me. So yeah, I want someone smarter than me. I mean, you know, clearly do I know my body better than anyone? Obviously, but that's when that dialogue comes into play. Like we were talking about, you know, I provide him with the feedback and the dialogue and he utilizes his knowledge to formulate a plan based around it. Right. So, you know, that's two people now kind of creating a, a, a plan together. So, um, you know, he's definitely got a way more vast, you know, database of knowledge in his head and definitely more experience. I mean, he's coached a lot more upper echelon bodybuilders that, that I have. That's for sure. So, um, you know, I, I would feel way safer having someone that I felt was a lot smarter steering, steering it than I would for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially like when it gets into the last week or so, I mean, I, I, I would crumble mentally. There's no way I can handle that. You know, so. yeah. I, I take my pictures and I just send them and then delete them after. I don't even want to look at them. That's, that's, I'm starting to get that, but it's very hard for me because I, I need to see it. But like, sometimes I'll look at it really quick. And I'm like, okay, send gone, you know? Yeah. He says that to me. He's like, you know how many times I've had, you know, clients said that they want to kill themselves after saying new pictures. Like, just don't look at it, man. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you, um, what would you say your biggest mistakes as a bodybuilder and as a coach are, or have been? That's a tough question. I mean, Mike, you know, as a bodybuilder, it's hard to say like really what <laughs> any mistakes are. Cause it's like, it's all like just a means to an end, like of a learning process that ends up where you are today. I mean, you kind of have to make those mistakes along the way, you know? You know, mm -hmm. I've, back and I've done some dumb shit. I mean, I've, you know, done silly protocols, you know, I've done silly, you know, carb ups, I've, you know, junk loaded shit. I've done, you know, a million things that I thought were stupid at the time, but if I hadn't done them, I wouldn't have known that they were fucking stupid, you know? So it's like, yeah. to, you know, so that's a hard one. I mean, I think the same, the answer goes the same to coaching. I mean, um, um, you know, the, the same thing goes into coaching, right? It's just, it's, you know, there's a million mistakes I've made, but, you know, I learned from every single one of them and that's kind of progressed me forward. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit and think of that as we keep talking about the specific. All right. Thing. All right. Cool. So I wanted to ask you, since you just brought up, you know, like cycles and stuff, you don't have to answer this, but I know people want to want to know what's your favorite off season cycle and what's your favorite pre-contest cycle. You don't have to give doses. Don't give doses, just compounds, whatever. Yeah. I mean, in the off season, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a, like a, not a, a multiple, like a, array of compounds guy. Like I would rather just, you know, have like two compounds, you know, a little, you know, a higher dose and a higher dose is relative. Like we're talking like, you know, maybe a gram of test and something else in there. Um, you know, like a good androgen just to feel as strong as possible. But like, I don't like getting too crazy. I don't like running really too much orals in off season or anything like that. That just fucking destroys my appetite and eating to me is just, primary number one so if it affects my appetite by any stretch of the meat like i just don't want it there it's just you know not even worth it for you know an extra two percent 
game to, you know, have your daily life just fucking dreading it every day, eating every meal for an oral. It's like, that's just something I'm not, I'm super not huge on. Um, you know, from the contest prep standpoint, I mean, I think everyone at this point kind of runs the same shit when we get into, into contest prep. I mean, you know, everyone's got their test of some kind, you know, when you get close, you have a short acting test and you guys are taking tread, master on, you know, wind straw, whatever it is when you get close. I mean, you know, I think the, the, the variety is pretty much the same. Um, you know, one thing I had never used that I did use this off season for a very short, like three or four week stint when we were doing that strength phase was that, that meant M E N T stuff, which I'd never even fucking heard of before, but I mean, shit, I ran that for four weeks and I swear I was, I felt like I was the strongest human on the planet. You know, <laughs> that's what I was like. I don't know if you guys have seen, like I've maybe Robin seen, like I have the videos, like where I was training at the, down to like LA fit expo training with Nick Walker. And I'm like doing five, six reps with five plate incline. I mean, you know, like I went from doing barely that for one rep to doing that for like five reps in like a matter of like three, four weeks, you know, wow. you know, with that, I know that's, that's fucking heavy, strong shit on you. So like anyone that's hearing this, don't go running long cycles back because it's definitely not good for you. But, uh, but it was definitely something to try and for that phase that we utilize it for, for the strength aspect was, was definitely very beneficial. So that was something. Yeah, really right. heard of it, so. Everyone's going to grab a mint like right now. You just <laughs> fucking, that was the shameless plug. Anybody who sells mint right now is going to make a lot of money. Yeah, I own shares in, in the mint. <laughs> <laughs> um, so aside from body parts then, uh, what do you think's kind of holding you back right now? Is you think, because I know you, you train hard. Um, you Like even in Greg's video, he, he admittedly said like you stick to your diet. You're pretty much on point with everything. So is it like, what do you think is holding you back now? Do you ever like, and again, just for me, when watching your training, I know I've referred back to that a lot, but do you ever like walk away from the gym and you're just like, fuck, I didn't really give it my all today. I could have pushed a little bit more. Do you think it's more of a mindset right now or knowledge? Yeah. I mean, like, look, we all have those workouts where we felt we looked a little something here. And, you know, as I get more experience, I think I have less and less of those days. I think they're very far few between now. And I think I am good now at really dialing myself in no matter what my mood is going into the workout to know that every single one is extremely pertinent and that I make sure that I don't waste those opportunities. Uh, so we talk about what's holding me back from a physique standpoint, if we wanted to like speak body parts. I mean, this is strictly from, you know, speaking last year, previous years, you know, I'm hoping that's obviously different this year. Uh, well, I know it is different this year. Um, you know, the, the only thing that was definitely holding me back was my back shots. Well, not even my back lap. My back double was was definitely the pose that was, you know, my front and back double were the ones that held me back the absolute most. Um, you know, like a lot of shots, my front lat, my side chest, my side try. I mean, I would crush even the top guys on side chest and side tries and most musculars. You know, and then we'd turn to the back and, you know, and the back double, I would I'd lose all the ground. I mean, like perfect example. I mean, I would lost, before I beat him in Tampa last year, I'd lost to Lucas Osladil, like, three or four times and Lucas only has one good pose and that's his back double bicep, you know? Mm -hmm. So I mean, he, I, I have, I mean, oh. six poses, he beat me in one, he beat me almost every single show. Um, so, you know, it just goes to show there the importance. I mean, I don't, I don't like that line, like our backs, back, good backs win shows or whatever. But, yeah. I mean, the, the proof is kind of in the pudding from, you know, a, a certain aspect for sure. I mean, you know, so that's, that's been, especially for the last three or four years, number one priority for me is bring up my back. No. And I think a lot of that for me, is a posing thing. Uh, I definitely wasn't displaying my back from a posing aspect, even close to as good as I could have. And that's been a big thing that I've been working on, especially this prep is really, really just making sure that that back double is as off, like as perfect as I can get it, um, you know, to, to showcase everything really good, which I think is, is night and day from last season for sure. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, and I mean, going back into things holding me back, I mean, posing just in general was definitely, you know, I felt I was definitely not displaying my physique to the fullest uh, in a number of poses that, you know, it's, and I don't want to say like, you know, if it was laziness to not pose, I think it was more fear. Like, you know, when you get into prep and, you know, I'm sure you guys, did, you get into prep and it's like, you don't want to look at yourself too much, you know? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I don't want to go into the, into the good life fucking, you know, group X room and pose. Cause like, I might see something I don't like and that'll ruin my fucking day, you know? Those so, fucking mirrors sometimes make you look real small, man. Exactly. So it's like, you know, I, <laughs> I think it's a hundred percent insecurity driven from my end. You know, like I, I think that my, my posing is just insecurity combined with laziness, but um, you know, I've definitely made, especially from a mandatory perspective to, to really try and hammer those down this, this prep. 
Um, so I think that'll definitely make a big, big difference. And I mean, you know, getting very specific with the show, I mean, the guy that I think is going to be the biggest threat in Tampa uh, will be Hunter, whose father is Lee Labrada. So you obviously know this motherfucker can pose, right? So, yeah. In my opinion, I just feel like it's one of those things like with the Franco, Franco Colombo, where he yeah. used to do his pose, but not, not show himself as big as he could be. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's like a subconscious thing or, or a conscious thing, I think that, you know, maybe working with someone with your posing or working on visualization or something might be able to improve with that. But yeah. I don't know. But I think you're I think you're right that if you just focus on displaying it better, then it'll it'll be a game changer. Yeah. And, and what I did a lot of this, too, is I will do rounds of posing videos where I only do the poses I think I look like shit in, you know, so I like that. It's just only my bad poses and I'll just get Melissa to watch those or send those to Patrick. And those will be the ones that I send my focus on. So it's like, yeah, I, I can hit side triceps and most musculars all day and look good in them. But like, what's the point of me sending that? If I can't send, you know, a back double and look good in any of them, it's like, well, I shouldn't be wasting my time sending my good shots. So, you know, and that's where we can get more feedback. And I think that sending those every, you know, him seeing that for sure, Patrick's definitely give me a lot of insight, even though he's not like necessarily a posing coach, like getting a Kenny Wallach or, you know, Chris Cormier or something like that. Um, you know, he's definitely been around bodybuilding and seen a lot of guys hit a lot of poses um, and definitely had some good cueing for me, uh, which has definitely made a big difference in, in my back double for sure. Yeah, Patrick is good with that. He he definitely corrected one of my poses just by drawing some little yeah, arrows that's on That's literally what I did. Just took the, took the picture and did it and drew some lines, push this here, do this, yeah. Yeah, but it's helpful, definitely. Very, very helpful. Yeah. You mentioned Melissa helps you uh, kind of with your with your posing and stuff. Do you find that, like, I mean, it's tough having, like, like, so many superstars, like, just surrounding you, you know? Does it get competitive with you guys, or is there any – no? No, I mean, it goes the other way. I mean, it, I have a very hard time – and Melissa, if she was here, would say this, that she fucking hates doing posing videos, because I don't believe a fucking word that comes out of her mouth when she yeah. <laughs> gives me feedback. Because she'll be like, you look crazy. I'm like, well, clearly you're not going to tell me I look like shit. So now she's <laughs> – like, no, no, I look good, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's like you hit that pose wrong. I'm like, motherfucker, what did you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, now I, get, I get offended by it, but I'm like, well, that's what I asked you to do. So, yeah. But, uh, the thing is, her and Patrick seem to be always on the same page. Like, I'll send, I'll take a video and she'll be like, ah, oh, you hit that pose a little weird, or, uh, you know, let's do this again, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll send it to Patrick and he'll say the exact same fucking thing. So, you know, that, that trust there from, you know, thinking that she knows what she's talking about is definitely getting better. Um, you know, but it's, it's hard with your spouse, right? I mean, you, you think that they just want to tell you whatever you need to hear, um, may, may, which may be from a confidence standpoint, I do, I just want to hear that, you know, just to feel good. But I know from a body link perspective, that's not what I need, uh, you know, especially from posing, you know, which is definitely a weak point for me. I, I definitely need to, you know, if, if it looks like shit, tell me right away and we'll sit here and we'll hit it for fucking 40 minutes until I get it right, you know? So I, I would rather it that way. But, you know, it's, it's definitely a learning process of you know kind of building that for sure it's hard when it's someone that you love you know like if my wife asks me to tell her how she looks i'll ask her like do you want coach or do you want yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, i coach both melissa and Chris, you know especially for melissa like you know when she's prepping for shows you know I, I, you ask any of my clients i'm brutally honest if you look like shit i'll tell it to your wife and i could care less but with Melissa, it's so much harder. I know I'm only doing it, her a disservice by not being 100% honest. But like, if I look at her one day and she's just like, you know, when I say something and I, I just try and like think of how I would feel. And it's so hard to be like, ah, you didn't really look good today. You know, it's, it's just like, it's, it's very, very difficult for me. Um, you know, and it's like, obviously you got to live with that person after, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not talk to them for the rest of the day. I got to fucking live in the house with her, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a little different, right? But, um, you know, I, at the end of the day, man, especially with bodybuilding, I mean, like honesty is the best policy. Nobody ever gets better by being fucking having their ass padded, you know? So, um, you, you know, it's, you know, obviously there's, there's levels to motivating people and some people respond better to different types of motivation. Um, you know, some people like that tough love and some people respond better to, you know, positive reinforcement. But at the end of the day, you still need to be honest with what you're saying. You just need to find a way to say it in whatever manner is going to help that person succeed the most. Right. I think that's good relationship advice, especially if it's a, a bodybuilding couple. I mean, you have to be honest, but you mm -hmm. have to, you have to know, you know, what's the right thing to say. And yeah. you also have to know when to say it because exactly. we get because so critical with our bodies that, you know, you can hear something and, you might be upset for the whole day, but 
hey, you know what? You had to hear it. So Yeah, no, I mean, it's right. I mean, how many times like I've hit a pose, you say it looks weird and then it pisses me off at the moment. But then I get so pissed off about it, I want to sit there for 30 minutes and hit the pose over and over and over. And then if by the end of that 30 minutes, I hit it a couple times perfectly, I forget about that beginning when I was pissed off that I hit it wrong and that she said it looked bad. So it's like at the end of the day, it led to the right outcome. It was just a minute of like insecurity and being upset over bullshit. But then you work towards obviously what the desired outcome is, which is to improve the, the pose, right? So, um, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just learning your partner and learning kind of what makes them tick and, uh, you know, and finding, you know, how to operate and how to motivate them the best without, you know, knocking them down, just making them feel like shit, right? So you got to have to find, you know, know each other well and have that trust built in there as well, right? Yeah. I wanted to ask you, do you find it better to prep together or do you find it better if one person's on prep and the other one's not? Yeah, I mean, generally we we do better prepping together. I mean, this year, because um, Melissa didn't compete really last year and I did four shows last year and then I've been prepping since basically January this year. Um, you know, and it's, it's been fine. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've had no issues whatsoever. I mean, you know, if she wants to go eat, she can go eat. I mean, if she wants to get takeout, I mean, I don't give a shit. You can eat McDonald's right in front of me. It really doesn't bother me. Um, you know, it's your life, not mine. So, um, you know, it, it, it's fine for me. I mean, I, you know, I don't really care either way, but um, we've done it. We, we always do very well when we're both prepping. You know, especially when Melissa didn't work before and we were both just living a hundred percent bodybuilding lifestyle. Um, you know, so it's kind of like nice. You wake up together, you go do cardio together, you come home, you eat a few meals, you go train together, you go to sleep at the same time. Like it's such a regimented lifestyle that you can kind of share together. Um, especially when you're doing the same shows. I mean, like when we did the Olympia or we've done Toronto and Vancouver pros together. Um, you know, when you're working toward that common goal at the same time and you know, you're kind of all on the same page, it's it's kind of like a rewarding thing to kind of share together. And I, we, we've definitely done well with it. I mean, we've had less issues doing shows together than we have when one is doing a show and one is not. So yeah. we had the same experience actually. So that's why yeah. I was curious. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's just like a level of, of understanding that like when you can, you're, you kind of get into your mood maybe while you're, while you're prepping on your own and that person isn't there. So yeah. they just, they just can't connect with you. But when they're going through that same struggle, they're just like, fuck like i get it yeah i mean there's also like a kind of like a i don't want to use the word monotony but there's almost like a like an absence to people when they're prepping you know what i mean you're kind of just like like there but like nobody's home at points you know mm -hmm. I mean, you're both on that same page nobody feels neglected you know it's yeah. like you know if like i'm tired and i don't want to talk too much and we both want to sit there in silence like we both understand you know but like if she's you know, had a good day at work and wants to talk about it. I'm like, yo, I'm just like tired. Like I can't, I don't want to, I just want to be quiet and like just chill. It's like, it's obviously a little different. It's like, Oh, wait, you don't want, you know, you don't want to talk to me. It's like, you know, but at least if you're on that same page, you're kind of in that common ground and everybody is like, Hey, this is where we are. Let's just chill. You know, it's, it's, you know, so it works good. But I mean, over time, you know, when you do them together enough or not do them or see them, someone do them enough, you kind of understand how people function in those States and you kind of just learn either way. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, me and Melissa together, since we've been together combined, have done over 30 shows, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of experience, you know? <laughs> yeah. Does she coach as well? Yeah, she, she does more like lifestyle coaching. So she does take a, good, a few girls that are like, you know, like level one. She ha does have some national level girls, like a couple here and there. Um, but yeah, I mean, the majority of the girls she takes are like, are like lifestyle clients, you know? What, um, what comes after bodybuilding for you, man? Like when we take away, when we take away bodybuilding from Ian, who's Ian? Like what, and what comes after? Yeah. I mean, well, first and foremost, I'm, I'm, I, I, I maybe this is not common for all bodybuilders. I, I relish the day that I can lose a fucking hundred pounds, man. Like the day I can just, play, <laughs> I'm losing, I just want to eat one meal today. But I wake up and I'm like, Hey, I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat all day. Well, fuck it. I won't, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of things that I, I used to do before bodybuilding that I'm really looking forward to getting back to I me. Mean, like I, like I said, before I did uh, bodybuilding, I ran track and field. And obviously I know if I'm 40 years old, I'm not gonna have a competitive track careers, but just to go back out and feel like I could run and like, you know, get into something that I, I really loved before bodybuilding. Um, you know, even if it's just at a fun recreational level, you know, something I'd really like to do. And, you know, I used to snowboard a lot, but you know, when you're 300 pounds, it's like you fall 300 pounds, you fuck some up, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just not worth it when this is my career. <laughs> like, just, you know, there's that fear there that it's just like, hi, hey, maybe I shouldn't do this. So, you know, just from a, you know, recreational standpoint, I mean, there's a million things I would just love to lose the weight and just like enjoy my life a lot more and the freedom 
um, you know, being out of bodybuilding from that aspect. Um, but you know, from a career standpoint, I mean, I know my bodybuilding is very, my life is very built, you know, and my reputation is very built around bodybuilding. So it's going to be probably something focused in that, whether I take, you know, start doing coaching as like an actual full-time gig and really put energy into that. Like right now, I mean, I maybe take 15 to absolute most 25 clients at a time. I mean, I don't really take too many. And most of the ones I do take are like, you know, on referral or people that I know pretty well personally. Um, you know, so I keep it pretty close quarters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so maybe after, you know, I'll get into the full-time gig. Like some guys are taking 100, 200 clients and, you know, really put my energy into that. Um, you know, make it a real business, um, you know, or something else. Maybe I'll get into the supplement industry and do some work there. I mean, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I mean, I know the avenues are there. And, um, you know, but I, I, I'm definitely excited for life after body. Like, I would be lying if I wasn't said I wasn't. <laughs> now, what do you want to accomplish before that happens though? Uh, yeah, I mean, from a, a bodybuilding goal perspective, I mean, what I could retire from bodybuilding feeling very happy and very accomplished if I get a first call out in Olympia at least once, you know, so whether it's, if, whether they do a six man call or a five man call, I don't give, give a shit. If I can have a six at the Olympia, I don't really care. Um, you know, but if I could get a top six, which I think is very realistic, I mean, that's like, you know, a guy like a Steve Cucklow is in the top six. I think that's a, a physique you know, in a placing at Olympia that is, is capable for me and my physique. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have delusions of grandeur that I think I'm going to win Olympia or even a top three might be a stretch, but, um, you know, to get a top six, I, I think, or a top five, I think it's definitely realistic. Um, especially the, you know, the progress I've been making year to year has been very linear. I mean, I'm not like, I don't feel like I'm tapped out. I mean, I'm, you know, 10% better than last year. Last year I was 10% than better than the year before. I don't think I, I think I still have a long ways to go in my physique. Um, so I think there is room to grow in there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could retire with a top six. If I don't ever get a top six, I mean, I'd really, really like to win Toronto pro just from a Canadian pride perspective. I mean, I was, you know, one spot off last year and I, I think that was just pure fuck up. I mean, I think if I looked like, <laughs> if I, looked like I did later in the season at like Vancouver or Tampa, I think I should have, I could have beat John. He definitely deserved to beat me on that day. Um, but I know that I was capable of much more. So I kind of let that one slip loose, but, um, you know, if I give that and get that opportunity again, I definitely will not make, make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, so, you know, I really would like to win Toronto and then I'm not a big Arnold guy, but I know that is a big prestigious thing in the art, in bodybuilding. Um, so, you know, if I ever did the Arnold, I mean, I guess a, a top three at the Arnold would be something nice to have on the resume, which, you know, I think is, is very doable. Um, so, you know, those are kind of what I'd be like top so first call at Olympia, the top three Arnold and win Toronto pro would kind of be things, you know, going in order Toronto pro would definitely be the first to come. You know, if Toronto pro was this year, that was my goal was to win Toronto as my Olympia qualifier. Yeah. Um, you know, and then after that, my goal for this year, if I qualify for the Olympia uh, is to be in the top 10 because the first, my first year I was 14. So I would like to at least be in the top 10, which I think seventh through 10th, 11th is, is very realistic based off the guys that I've beaten in competition uh, you know, that I'm always kind of in the mix around. They're kind of in that same, you know, seven to 10 range. Um, so I think that's kind of where I would fall this year, um, which I think would be realistic. And then, you know, obviously work up from there. So, you know, if I can gain a place a year kind of thing, you know, within five years, being that top five, top six, I think that's kind of where I'm, where I'm looking at. That's right. It's like starting at that level, you're really starting at the bottom again, but it's a whole yeah. other level. You got to climb back up. Yep. Yeah. You know, you said you normally, like, I know that you've said before, you normally get better with shows, right? Like you, the past couple of years, since I've gotten to bodybuilding and watch you, you do maybe what, four shows, three shows at minimum, a couple though. Yeah, um, 2019, I did four, four shows plus the Olympia in 2018, so four and five shows. I did nine shows between those two years. Mm -hmm. you, so going into this year with everything that's happened, going into Tampa, I, I mean, I see you as definitely, you know, contending for that number one spot because, yeah, like you said, there's Hunter. There's some other great bodybuilders that are going to be there, but I don't know who else is really going to really going to yeah. push your – yeah, exactly. Um so if you win that, do, are you planning on doing more shows knowing that you get better or are you just going to kind of save yourself you know, for Olympia? If this was a different year with like, you know, how travel is right now, maybe I would consider it. But I mean, you know, the, the 
possibility of other shows is obviously low, you know, I mean, there's shows are getting canceled left, right and center. So there's always, mm-hmm. that you know, if I can avoid as much travel into the U S as possible, I would obviously like to do that as well. Um, you know, and also there has to be something said for momentum, right? I mean, if I win a show like Tampa, it's a big show, uh, you know, and then I go show up and do California and I come like second or third or something, um, you know, that's kind of a loss of momentum in the eyes of the judges that are going to see you at the Olympia, right? So I'd like to, the last time they have seen me would have been winning a show. And then I see them at the Olympia, they say, hey, this guy won Tampa, not, oh, this guy came third in Puerto Rico, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know I want that to be the, the precious memory of me in, my, in their mind. Um, you know, and the only reason I had done multiple shows the previous years is because I hadn't qualified for the Olympia yet, you know? <laughs> you know, once I, once I won Spain in 2018, I hung that shit up and waited for the Olympia. I mean, last year I missed it by fucking one point, um, you know, which was obviously frustrating, but I was very happy with the package I brought to Tampa. So it was kind of like silver linings. It's like, yeah, I didn't make it, but, you know, it's my best package of the year. And, you know, I was sliced to the nines and I got to duel it out with, you know, guys like Dexter and Luke. So, you know, it was definitely a, a show I remember very well. And, know really enjoyed so um yeah i mean i i love competing in the aspect that i like to see what i can do show to show i mean i'm not a guy like i don't like doing the posing i don't like getting shaved down i don't like tanning like i don't i don't like the like pageantry of bodybuilding by any means i mean i'm not in this i'm in this because i like to slug heavy weights and i like to have big muscles and i like to look a certain way and a lot of it, I mean, obviously, to an extent, I would probably do whether I competed or not. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't push the envelope like I do in bodybuilding. That would just be reckless. But, um, you know, there's still still a physique that I would like to have just whether it's part of bodybuilding or not. You know, like I, I like to look good and feel good about how I look. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I definitely wouldn't be pushing as many shows. I mean, uh, it depends. I mean, like if, if my first show like this past year before they got canceled, I was planning to do Puerto Rico first. And whether I won Puerto Rico or not, I was still going to do Toronto. So I was planning to do the two no matter what, if I won both, if I won Puerto Rico, whatever, uh, because that Toronto win I really, really wanted. Um, and like you said, I do get better with shows. So we were going to kind of like use Puerto Rico as like the first one, you know, kind of get our feet wet there and hopefully get a win, take the pressure off me for Toronto and then do Toronto as like the one that really like meant something to me. Um, obviously, plans have changed and this year has been fucking weird. So. Um, yeah, no, no matter what happens this year, if I, if I win Tampa, it's done till the Olympia hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. So I don't want to take too much more of your time. Appreciate your time already. Yeah, of course. I got one more question. I want to ask you a little bit of switching gears, but is there anything that you do personally to kind of maximize your recovery and sleep in order to make sure you perform the best the next day? Yeah, I mean, I'm a terrible one to ask about sleep because I fucking live on the, the wackiest sleep schedule ever. I'm like a kind of guy that like goes to bed at four o'clock in the morning and I kind of wake up and the, like Melissa gets up for like at like five thirty six to go to work. So I kind of like wake up when she wakes up after like two hours of sleep, you know, I'll kind of like half wake up and then I go back to bed and maybe sleep to like 10, 30, 11. Uh, and then I'll wake up and do my cardio, eat my first meal and then I'll go back to sleep. So, you know, my sleep schedule is definitely weird. Um, but at the end of the day, like you said, I'm still trying to get as much sleep as possible and I'll, you know, I'll optimize that by taking a nap during the day and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what anyone else's perspective of this is. I'm a big guy. I'm like, I smoke weed before bed every single day. Um, you know, and that's made a big difference for me and not even from just my sleep. I've always slept really well, but just from like, especially when I get into prep and like anxiety is high, you know, and your fucking mind is running wild just to like, you know, smoke a bit, relax and enjoy that last meal of the day and kind of just chill out. Um, you know, I definitely think that's done a lot for my headspace for sure during this prep. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling people to go smoke a bunch of weed and it's going to make them a better bodybuilder, but <laughs> for, for me, it's definitely been something that I, I, you know, I never did until maybe the last, I, I never smoked weed period really until the last like maybe 18 months. And then, you know, it's definitely become part of my, my regime, especially during prep to, you know, really just like unwind at the end of the day and like get a good sleep and, you know, just relax a bit, you know, especially these last couple of weeks, like, you know, getting to the end of the day and anyone that's done shows, I'm sure you guys know, like the prep anxiety, it's just like, and ants in your pants that you like can't control. Yeah. You feel like you need to be doing something, but like there's nothing to do. It's fucking midnight. What the fuck are you doing? You know? So, and like, you buy shit. Like, yeah, and it's like I get into this like this where I can't even like I can't even sit and like play a video game. I sit for like two seconds and I'm like, I gotta get up and do something. I'm like, you are doing something. It's like yeah. you know, I can't watch Netflix, like anything. I just need to like be up and moving. So at least when I like smoke a bit, I chill out. I'm like just like, yo, just like chill and watch some TV. Like you don't need to be doing shit right now, man. So you know, I think that's been good for my my crazy hyper mind you know especially at the end of the day it, you know as we get close to shows has definitely been beneficial for me but um you know people 
you know, I, I don't think there's like any right or wrong way, but like, obviously you want to get as much sleep as you possibly can. And if you're someone that's your, your time restraint is, you know, based off work schedule or something like that, definitely try and find, you know, some time after you're done work or something, get a good nap in, especially before training, just to like make sure you're feeling hundred percent fresh and like rest and ready to go before training for sure. Um, you know, that's, that's where my two cents would be. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show, Ian. Uh, wishing you luck. I'll definitely be watching you Tampa, uh, on the Tampa Bay or ta it's Tampa, yeah, Tampa Bay Pro. We're going to see you fuck shit up. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, just hang in there. Thank you for, for being on the show and joining me and Rob, though. Make sure everyone you like, subscribe to the video. Go give Ian um, a follow um, and watch his progress going into the show. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and, uh, appreciate you know, it. Good luck with Tampa there, Ian, and, you know, best of luck with the traveling and everything, man. Thanks, guys. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. All right, man. Easy. Thank you guys for coming on here. Take care, guys. Yeah.